would also like to criminalize gay sex and refers to abortion as a holocaust. When you read and look at Mike Johnson's history, the issue of homosexuality has been extremely prominent in his writings. It's really a focus of his attention and his energy. Um, and abortion. Those are the two those are the two issues. He is a culture warrior mm -hmm. in the true and authentic sense. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I was thinking of doing something a little bit different today, stepping back from the horse race, stepping back from the latest shambolic stories about what's happening in Congress. We may be only days away from another government shutdown because nobody can get their act together. We will see. But I thought this would be a good moment to pull the lens back just a little bit and ask how we got here and what is happening and who better to do that than our our guest today, Peter Weiner, contributing writer at The Atlantic and The New York Times, the author of a number of books, including The Death of Politics. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum and served in the Reagan, Bush 41 and Bush 43 administrations, which we refer to as the before times around here. Welcome back on the podcast, Peter. Great to be with you, Charlie. Thanks for all you are doing and your colleagues are doing. Well, you had a brilliant piece in The Atlantic that put everything into context, including um, what's happening now in Congress. A lot of a lot of coverage right now about whether or not uh, the new speaker, Mike Johnson, whose name I'm still getting used to, Mike Johnson, because I, I, there's part of me that always thinks I'm getting that name wrong, right? It's like, yeah. okay, it can't be Mike Johnson, right? It's got to <laughs> be. So, um, I, you know, everybody was asking, who is Mike Johnson? And now the week's news is flooded with, will, will Mike Johnson be able to, uh, you know, keep the government open without losing the hard right? Um, we, we know that it was a continuing resolution that brought down Kevin McCarthy. Can he pull the rabbit out of the hat? Does he need Democratic votes? And this whole kabuki dance. But your piece, I thought, was really interesting because it, it 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 described who Mike Johnson was, and, and you know none of us actually do this. And the headline was the polite zealotry of Mike Johnson. And you wrote this shortly after he became the speaker. And you start off by noting that when Johnson was asked by Sean Hannity about where people could find out about his worldview, he said people should just pick up the Bible. What did that mean? Peter, help me understand this guy. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it was a it was an interesting um, response that he gave to uh, to Hannity. Um, I think for him, what it meant was that if you consult the Bible, um, you would have a view of what Mike Johnson saw about the world, and you would have a sense of what was true. Uh, and right and ordered um, about mm -hmm. about the, the world. It, it okay. was kind of a manual. Um, not only to to understand, make sense of reality, but also to understand his politics and that you could make some kind of uh, connect the dots uh, from from the Bible to to whatever he happened to to believe. I think that, uh, that the details are a little fuzzy. Not sure that, what Leviticus says about continuing resolutions. Well, that's right. That's right. Actually, that, that's an interesting way to put it, because I think the details are extremely fuzzy, but I don't think they're fuzzy for Mike Johnson. I think mm -hmm. that's the important thing to understand. For him, I think it is it is a book that will, will instruct him on, on politics and every aspect mm -hmm. of his life. I think that that's extremely shallow and misguided just as a person of the Christian faith, which I am, because when it comes to the interpretation of the Bible, what scholars refer to as hermeneutics, it's a very complicated thing. You know, the Bible itself is written over thousands of years by dozens of dozens of different people, often arguing and saying different things at different times. So it requires discernment to try and figure out what in the Bible applies in any yeah. particular moment that you're that you're that you're in. So I think he's wrong on um, on that. But I think the other thing to understand about about Mike Johnson, and, and I know the kind of person he is just because of my own life within mm -hmm. the evangelical world, where I've spent a fair amount of my, my, my adult life, always somewhat on the fringes, I would say. But I know um, the, the subcultures, and I think I understand how a lot of these folks think. And I, for Mike Johnson, I think he is a zealot. Now, he, he's a mild-mannered mm -hmm. and polite zealot, um, I would say, by, certainly by, by MAGA standards. So his uh, his rhetoric is not as abrasive and and reckless 
uh, at least as often uh, as as a lot in in MAGA world. But he is a true believer. He's not a cynic like Kevin McCarthy right. was, or like Lindsey Graham is, or like J.D. Vance is. I think he really, really believes, and that has its own uh, worries that that attend uh, that attend well, to it. Let's talk about what he believes. Uh, you wrote that he has deep ties to the Southern Baptist Convention and believes in a literal <clears throat> reading of the Bible. And he's close friends with uh, Ken Ham who is an Australian fundamentalist and creationist um, and has provided legal services to his organization, Answers in Genesis. So what does Answers in Genesis believe? Well, one of the things that they believe is that the earth and the universe are 6,000 years old. Um, and so they okay. don't think that uh, the first couple of chapters or the first 11 chapters in Genesis uh, are in any sense figurative, uh, or even even using as as uh, C.S. Lewis referred to true true myth to try and, and, and express truths. Mm. So that tells you a certain mindset, 6, right? Mm. So Six thousand dinosaurs. Old. What's the dinosaur? Um, how do they? The dinosaurs were with the people on the ark. Uh, it's it's pretty convoluted, and it's really really fascinating psychologically. And I think we see this manifestation in MAGA world too. But what it tells you, one thing it tells you about Mike Johnson is this is a person who is impervious to evidence uh, and to reality, sets up a force field. So all of the overwhelming evidence, I mean, it's just not it's it's, it's not an open question about the, the age of the earth, certainly when it comes to being six or 10,000 years old. But it doesn't matter because his starting point is this is what the Bible teaches and the mm. Bible is true. And therefore, it must be true in any evidence contrary to that has to be explained. And that's where you see these leaps of logic, these twists and knots of rationalizations and justification. And when you're dealing with somebody like that, you know, in day-to-day -day life, that has its own challenges. Yeah, but yeah. when you have people like that in political leadership, that is you doubly know, or triply troubling. I, I actually worked with a guy um, who was a very competent professional, very, very creative guy and completely normal and rational uh, until yep. you began talking about the age of the earth. And then, right. as you point out, he was impervious to any kind of information. So carbon dating, um, yep. fossils, um, archaeology, all of that is fake news. Uh, yep. And you write that Johnson is, is not just on board. You wrote Johnson is enthusiastically on board. That's right. I'm, yeah, that's right. I mean, they... They they have uh, these mm. uh, you know okay. uh, arc uh, in in Kentucky where there there's uh, thousands maybe probably tens of thousands yeah. hundreds of thousands of people will will visit um, that these museums that they they have set uh, they have their own set museums up. It, yeah exactly exactly and this answers in Genesis uh, you know if you're a person in the Christian world you will, well, at least some parts of the Christian world you will have heard of them and they will go through and they have websites. And any questions that come up, theological or, or, or otherwise, but particularly related to science, they think that they, the answers are literally in Genesis and they'll, they'll give, it, give it to you. If it were confined, and it went in terms of Mike Johnson, just to this issue, I mean, I'd obviously have my differences with them and it would be worrisome, but it would be contained. But I would say that the trouble is that that kind of mindset, in my estimation, permeates Johnson in all sorts of ways. Well, we can talk about it, but including and, in the in the uh, election denial. Well, and also, I mean, in, in terms of like the relevance of this, uh, Johnson thinks that churches should be more politicized and that the yeah. so-called Johnson Amendment, no relation, which prevents churches from engaging in political activity to keep their tax exempt status should be overturned. Lots of evangelical conservatives uh, believe that he'd exactly. also like to criminalize gay sex and refers to abortion as a holocaust. Okay, right. so the, the the politicization of churches, let's leave that to one side. The criminalization of, of gay sex, that does put him outside the mainstream, even of conservative thought, even, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say MAGA thought, because I, originally I don't think that MAGA was about criminalizing gay sex for all the other things that you and I find right. deplorable about it. That's that's kind of, that's on the edge of even of, of edge MAGA, right? 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And he's avoided that topic since he's been speaker, and I understand why 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 he has. Yeah. I assume that that deep down his views haven't changed because I do think he's a he's a true believer. He may make the utilitarian judgment, the prudential judgment, not to talk about it. This was in the context of the case years ago. You'll remember uh, Lawrence v. Texas. Yes. Uh, and and uh, I, I think Justice Scalia wrote a dissenting opinion on um, on on that, and that had to do with the criminalization of of of, uh, of gay sex. But when you read and look at Mike Johnson's history, the issue of homosexuality has been extremely prominent in his writings. It's really a focus of his attention and his energy um, and abortion. Those are the two, those are the two issues. And the groups that he's been affiliated with back in the 2000s and, uh, and later made these issues primary and he was his lawyer and he he uh, advocated for those groups but he clearly shares their worldview he is a culture warrior mm -hmm. in the true and authentic sense okay so let's talk about his attitude towards school shootings um which i can half understand and then we get to a different area here you you write that he thinks the school shootings are the result of generations of Americans being taught that there is no right or wrong, that it's about right. survival of the fittest, and you evolve from the primordial slime. Now there are a lot right. of conservatives who've argued, like you know Bill Bennett, uh, you know back in the the nineties before before MAGA in the in the before times that that you know clearly we are seeing a a, a collapse of traditional values of right and wrong of morality. That that's not you know that's right. not particularly zealot you know, zealotry, but are you suggesting that he's also, that he also believes that school shootings are the result of belief in evolution, um, belief in any of these things? I mean, so because these a, start to tie together. Yeah, the, exactly. The, 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 you know, for him, religion is not in the box over here. Right. It, it seems exactly. to inform even his attitude towards. So talk to me about that. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. I think that's a reasonable surmise from what he said. He didn't say it directly, but he heavily yeah. implied it. Part of it is, again, I, I think that when you have that kind of mindset, you are committed and determined to dry and obliterate the ideology that you don't agree with, right? So he right. thinks evolution is this enormous threat yeah. um, and a moral it's threat. Like a because cancer on our civilization then. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah. so what does he do? He ties these horrific school shootings to the idea of evolution, because if you don't have evolution, if because of evolution existed, then you can't have right and wrong. And there's no argument for, for the morality of, of, uh, of individuals. So he's using these current day events to try and discredit evolution, because that's so contrary to, to his worldview. Now, of course, when you get into the, the realities of the school shootings, there are a couple of things that you have to keep in mind. The vast majority of the people who are committing these, it's it's not as if uh, people who, you know, high school kids that 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 weren't um, disciplined because they were late, uh, you know, for going to class or because right. they had their, their cell phones. These are people who are mentally ill and deeply yeah. deranged, overwhelmingly so. So this, the normal moral infrastructure that, shapes most people doesn't apply to them because they're not mentally right. well. So his argument would fail on, um, on, uh, on, on those grounds. And in addition, other countries have problems that we have in terms of moral dissolution and right. mental health, as Without you've talked many shootings. times on the show. Exactly. So that's, that's the problem. But again, from my perspective, it's what do we learn about Mike Johnson and his worldview that informs where he is now, what can we expect from him? Okay, just one 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 step back. This may, may seem yeah. like a digression to some people. What do most mainstream Christians think about evolution and morality? Most mainstream Christians do not reject evolution, but they also do not believe that evolution means that there is no right and wrong. Correct. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it depends. Of course, in, in the Christian world, yeah, you have fundamentalists, right, right. you have hyper evangelicals, then you have mainline, and you have more progressive Christians. So you have a you have a wide range of views. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the mo the I, I would guess the majority of Christians. There's the issue of evolution, right? Which yeah, is right. Uh, that's right. one set of questions, and then the other is if evolution existed. Did that, would that mean that there couldn't be a moral standard for us, right, right, and wrong? I think most 
Christians would say no, and right. that God used. I mean, if you, for example, Francis Collins, who's who's the esteemed former mm-hmm. director of NIH and run founded a group called BioLogos, which is an effort mm-hmm. to try and bridge the world of science and faith. Um, and it's an outstanding, standing group, and often in the sites, by the way, of Answers in Genesis. You know, they they would argue, of course, that evolution is true. It's scientifically true. We 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 know it for mm-hmm. a fact. But that God can use evolution in yeah. his, in this unfolding drama and this unfolding story. And certainly, precisely because we know evolution is true, and we know moral standards exist, and there are moral people, that itself explodes the theory that evolution means that you can't be moral. Okay, let's go back to Mike Johnson. Um, your article uh-huh. had just so much detail here that you know there's, there's somebody else that needs to be um, known to understand Mike Johnson's worldview of somebody, and I'm not familiar with his work, David Barton, not well known outside of evangelical fundamentalist circles, but very, very significant within them. He uh, is a graduate. He, he went to Oral Roberts University, was the chairman of the Texas Republican Party. He advises people like Mike Huckabee, Newt Gingrich, Michelle Bachman. He considers Trump to be one of the five greatest presidents in American history. So who is David Barton? Why is he significant in this story? Yeah, he's significant because he uh, took on a role as essentially a revisionist historian. And he's not a historian by training. Mm -hmm. He's very, very popular within some of the subcultures of the evangelical world, for example, in some of the homeschooling movements, some of his teachings, his textbooks, his conferences. Um, and so a lot of people who are in the fundamentalist and uh, in some areas of the evangelical world would have gone to the conferences that, 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 uh, mm-hmm. that he had. And his basic argument and theory and thesis is that America is a Christian nation, that the founders were Christian themselves, that the idea of the separation of church and state is a myth, it's a fiction. There shouldn't be such a thing. He's probably most noted for a book that he wrote, Jefferson's Lies, which I think came out in 2012. And it argued that that Jefferson was an orthodox, traditional Christian and that the interpretations that most people have, which was revisionist. I think it's safe to say that as a revisionist view of Thomas Jefferson. It's a we know it's a revisionist view of Thomas (laughs) Jefferson and Jefferson scholars just eviscerated the book. It's <laughs> it's just filled with falsehoods. They call it awful, but this, relentlessly anti-intellectual. Yes, exactly. And it really it really is. Interestingly, Charlie, this was all I mean, the, the book itself was published uh, pre-Trump. And these were signs on the American right, which I think you and I sort of saw. There yeah. were elements of these. Sure, but we, I, we knew these thought people. that they yeah. were. Yeah. But we thought that they were. Fringe, more fringe than they turned out to be, and it was more contained, I think, than than it turned out to be. But Barton is a prominent figure, sold a lot of books, and he and Johnson are, are quite close. Wow. Uh, Johnson and his wife ha- had a podcast. I think they've ceased it now, and and Johnson would would appear on it, and and Johnson himself has said something to the effect that you can't understand me without understanding uh, Barton. And he, he says and his, that. and his views. Yeah. Okay, so again, to, yeah. to understand Johnson, it, you do want to understand this world that, that Barton is coming from. Well, uh, Christian, uh, Kristen uh, Dumay, who's uh, been a guest on this podcast, history yeah. professor, is, is a scholar of all this, has written about Barton's claims. What that means, you know, that uh, the Thomas Jefferson wanted a Orthodox Christian nation. What that means is that he kind of takes conservative white evangelical ideals from our current moment and says that those were all baked into the Constitution and that God has elected America to be a special nation and the nation will be blessed if we respond in obedience and maintain that and not if we go astray. It really fuels evangelical politics and the idea that evangelicalism has a special role to play to get the country back on track. And as you write, uh, Barton is reportedly giddy about uh, Mike Johnson's ascension, and he's spoken right. with his team about the kind of people he needs as his staff. I mean, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, Kristen uh, Dume is a, is a very uh, distinguished historian, and she wrote a very good book called Jesus and John Wayne. I want to say one point about this, which I think is is important to understand, which is politics by its nature is infused with passion and strong strong beliefs. That's, that's the nature of the um, of the enterprise. But when you overlay that and people think this is not only, you know, debates about the, the, the meaning of the republic and the country, 
but that this is actually a uh, an epic struggle between the children of light and the children of darkness and that God is on one side and Satan is on the other. Then you've taken politics, which is, as I said, inherently intense and difficult right. and, and elicits passions. And you had this jet fuel of saying that this is an epic cosmic spiritual struggle. Right. And then the people that, that believe this, and they many of them believe it in good faith, then they take it upon themselves as essentially kind of warriors for God. And it's not just our country that we're fighting for, but it's for God and God's ways. And then you can see how politics right. gets into very, very dangerous territory. Becomes very toxic and why you would not consider uh, compromise or bipartisanship to be virtues exactly. in any way whatsoever. In fact, they are betrayals. Okay, yeah. so setting aside Mike Johnson, you wrote last week, in the New York Times, and this this, this sort of thing is, is really a, a, a gut punch, I, I think, tying together, um, you know, the before times. Um, you wrote in the New York Times last week that one of the books that most electrified conservatives over the last 50 years was Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, which was published in 1987. And I am old enough to remember this and, and remember what the reaction was that, and as you wrote, it, it warned, uh, the closing of the American mind, warned of the dangers posed by moral relativism and nihilism of accepting everything and denying reason's power. And Bloom argued that the denial of truth and the suppression of reason were leading to a crisis of civilization and that that was the fault of the new left. This was embraced universally by conservatives, I, I think, well, close to it. And you at the time, we're working in the Reagan administration's Department of, of Education. And obviously, you were very interested in higher education. I was very interested in higher education. And so at that point, you could almost define uh, conservatism as pushing back against moral relativism and nihilism. What happened, Peter? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of things um, happened, um, and uh, all of them are disquieting and uh, and, dis and and disturbing. Um, one of the things that happened, and I, I quote uh, Rich Taffel, who's the chief executive of Public Squared, who said that um, in his conversations with people on the right, that um, they try th there are narratives they tried fighting the left for years. Yeah. Um, but the game had changed and that and that trying to um, go against work against the identity politics of the postmodern left just wasn't working. And so they came to embrace the politics of postmodernism, which basically means that there's no truth. You can make up your own narratives. You can ignore evidence that you that you uh, that you want. Um, and I think that that became for them not only a, a way to win. I, I heard any number of times, and I'm guessing you did too, Charlie, this actually started in 2016. A number of these people, by the way, were Christians that, that I spoke to. And what they said about, about Donald Trump uh, at that time um, is, look, he's a person of flawed character. In, in the conversations I had, they would, mm -hmm. they would admit, that whether it was Mitt Romney or John McCain or George W. Bush, Trump's character was worse than 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 uh, than theirs. But what they said is that uh, a version of um, he understands the nature of the struggle. He's going to bring a gun to a cultural knife fight. He understands the enemy. These these other people are too genteel. Right. And I still have conversations, literally emails within the last several weeks with people in MAGA world <clears throat> who believe that the left uh, is is not only destructive to everything that they believe in, but is immoral and will use any means and methods necessary. And so one person um, literally told me that Trump is not good and decent, but good and decent doesn't work anymore. And yeah, that he right. was the one person who could. Feed. So what they came to, to do is to embrace <clears throat> this kind of nihilistic approach to politics, the will to power. Uh, not going to be constrained by, by, so, by yeah. rules or norms. Mm -hmm. So I think no, that's that's. Well, and this is what you, you wrote is the Republicans have embraced uh, nihilism. Um, you know, the American right most fully embodies the attitudes that alarmed Alan Bloom back in 1987. And then you go through all of this. I mean, just witness the right's embrace of Trump's cruelty, his remorselessness, his vindictiveness, his conspiracy theories. I mean, no other president 
has been so disdainful of knowledge and annihilating truth each week as statements become more deranged, more menacing, more authoritarian. I mean, the attacks on the prosecutors and judges, we can just run through all of that. The people that he suggests that he would have executed, you know, <clears throat> joking about the attack on Nancy Pelosi's yep. husband. And as you point out, he's wildly popular with the right. And it, as it turns out, his indecency is is a plus. Right. His supporters are galvanized by the criminal charges against him because now that becomes the signal of that he's being politically persecuted. And so this is what's different in 2016 because he was kind of alone. I remember thinking to myself at one point, okay, Trump's bad, but there are just not a lot of, you know, you know, many Trumps around the country. And now right. we've seen hundreds of imitators across the country. So you wrote, the haunting question raised by Alan Bloom is more relevant now than it was when he first posed it. When there are no shared goals or a vision of the public good, is the social contract any longer possible? I'm going to turn yeah. the question on you. Is it? It is, but it's it's being challenged. A lot is at stake. Uh, this is a tremendously difficult and disorienting period. In some ways, I think it's it's the greatest threat to the republic since the lead up to the Civil War. I would say that the next 12 months, whether Trump wins this election or not, uh, will go a good distance toward determining the degree to which the republic as we've known it <clears throat> is 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 going to continue and and. Uh, and and survive um and the le and the right has has not only embraced the postmodernism but with a kind of zeal that even the left didn't and i think it's more widespread on the uh on the right there's a kind of psychic satisfaction that i've seen on the american right you know that we refer to it as 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 you know of <clears throat> of trolling the of uh uh trolling the libs and owning mm -hmm. the libs right. we refer to it as as owning the uh owning the libs and there is a kind of delight that people take in being able to make arguments that they want that are removed and distanced from facts. Um, it, uh, they, they can just throw out any, any narratives that they, uh, that they want. And what, I think what happened, I think that people at the time, uh, most people who were conservative or the American right, embraced the Bloom thesis. I think they would have said that they, they believed it. But I think what happened is over time when they felt like they weren't winning and that the, the, the ends and justify the means came into play and they began a step at a time to discard the moral norms that they had held to, always coming up with a rationalization that, look, we, right. have, to, we have to cut this corner in order to defeat the left because defeating the left and defeating the Democratic Party is primus inter Paris for the survival of the, of the country. And at each step and each accommodation, it became easier to make the next accommodation. And so what was a what was a bug for Don Donald Trump in 2016 became a feature by 20, 2020, and now it's an aspect of, of him in which they, they celebrate it because they feel uh, like he hates yeah. the same people that we do. He drives the left crazy, and anybody that does that is, 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 is somebody that warrants our support. So it's, it's really disturbing, and of course, for people like you and I who grew up in the conservative or formed by the conservative movement, it's, it's disorienting. It's very disoriented. It does feel like the upside down world. And in, in yeah. your piece in the Times, you you also reference the work of Jonathan Rausch, uh, who wrote the Constitution of Knowledge, talking about the way the incentive structure. And I think you've hinted at this. The incentive structure has you know really been reversed. I mean, it's played an indispensable role in this this epistemic crisis here because, as as you point out. I think people in the media have discovered that, especially the right right wing ecosystem, have discovered you know that spreading these lies and the resentments is very very profitable. There is an audience for it. people like this; they want it, even if they know it's not true. And this is something that I wrestle with. It's like, do you believe that lie, or do you not care whether it's a lie? That it's just the the utility. As as long as it's the cudgel that triggers the libs, I'm willing to say it. And this goes back to a, a conversation I, I had about Carrie Lake. Is is Carrie Lake nuts or is she just fundamentally thoroughly dishonest? And I'm not sure which is worse. Um, I actually believe that she knows it's all bullshit, but this is what you have to do these days. And they kind of like it. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And it's a puzzling question. I mean, I think the way I view it is that there's a spectrum. And there's some people who were true believers, uh, yeah. like probably Sidney Powell. Uh, and uh, and then there are people who are deeply cynical, I would say, like yeah. like Lindsey Graham. I do think that 
uh, for an awful lot of people who are, who are Trump supporters and MAGA supporters, it's a combination. And just give me a sec to explain what, what sort of my theory is, which is impor- yeah. informed by yeah. clinical psychologists and social psychologists that I've talked to, which is there's a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is <clears throat> when you live at odds with what your values are. And if you know it, and that creates an enormous internal tension, uh, right? Think about in a sense of a, of a minister that goes up and and gives a sermon on Sunday and has an affair on Tuesday or Wednesday, and then comes back the following Sunday. People probably wonder how, how the heck does that person get Mm -hmm. away with that without, um, feeling disgust and self-loathing? And I'm, I'm like, well, what happens? A lot of people that, that have affairs like that, they justify, you know, Mm -hmm. my, my spouse wasn't paying attention to me. Mm Uh, I wanted to, you know, get out of this. It wasn't working or whatever. And so they're able to do it. We all, um, have, uh, uh, our mind works to allay and mitigate cognitive dissonance. So we're not living in this tension. So in my experience, when I've talked and communicated with people in Trump world and MAGA world and laid out, not in provocative language, but laid out very methodically, facts and circumstances, I can see psychologically what they do, which is how they, sh- mm-hmm. how they change the conversation, um, how they tend to mitigate how awful Trump is, and then they try and escalate how bad Biden is. So they're basically looking for a draw on the right. morality of Biden and Trump, hence Hunter Biden and so forth. They have to keep in the front of their mind this notion that um, that Biden and the Democrats are an existential struggle. And if you said, look, he's been president for three years, some things you may disagree with, some things you may agree with, but the country is not in, in a markedly worse shape and in some ways better shape than a Trump. It no. doesn't matter. They have to no. hold to this idea and the rationalizations, you know, kick in, which is uh, these uh, indictments are political prosecutions and the impeachment was a political prosecution. And we can't trust the evidence because it's the mainstream well, media that, that hates him. Well, and, and it is very interesting how effective this is um, because, uh, you know, I, I, I have written as, as you have about Trump's threats to, to weaponize uh, the criminal justice system, to have a regime of, of revenge and retribution. And the almost universal response from MAGA world is, first of all, good. Uh, second, but because that is what Democrats are already doing. So that everything yeah. that Trump is saying is simply a mirror of what Joe Biden is doing. So let me ask you this, because you've described this this Manichaean world as the children of light versus the children of darkness right. and why you need to embrace, you know, all of all of these things in order to defeat, you know, the, the satanic opposition. What is it that... And you've had these conversations. What is it that they hate and fear the most on the left? What do they seize on? I mean, what is it's not about inflation. It's not about the fiscal policy. It's not about the infrastructure bill. What is it that they see as so dangerous? Is it gender related stuff? Is it what 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 is it? Yeah, it's an important question because in the effort to try and understand where they're coming from, you, you do want to try and get some right. s- some degree of insight into their world. I would say it's, um, I, I think about it in, in, on several levels. I think there's just a core reaction that the left and the progressive movement is uh, dangerous and anti-American and anti values. So there's this, there's this starting point that they're a threat to what we believe. In terms of, if you said, look, tell me exactly what it is about the left mm-hmm. uh, that worries you. Th- then you have to get into <clears throat> distinction between Biden and the left, because <clears throat> Biden has shown that he's not hard left. For them, they would say, most recently, Hamas and Israel. So that's some of what I've heard, which is, and there, I think that that's a completely legit legitimate point to, to make. We're seeing the, <clears throat> the progressive movement expose at least parts of the progressive movement. Some of in it, their, yeah. It, s- right. s- sympathy. yeah. Some of it is not. It's a complicated right. issue, but there is enough that's going on in the campuses and elsewhere. So they, w- they would mention <clears throat> that. They would mention gender and abortion uh, is often uh, a- an issue that's there. I would say that transgenderism has replaced homosexuality um, as as the, the, the main concern within so. sexual <clears throat> ethics, but that, but homosexuality is, is still there too. They still mention to this day, defund the police. 
mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> because a few yeah. radicals in the Democratic yeah. Party used that in in 2020, even though Biden supports funding the police and so forth. So I, I think those <clears throat> excuse me, I think those are the issues that they would that they would point to. But it's very visceral. Uh, and it's a sense that they believe that the left and the progressive movement is out to destroy the country, destroy their children. And I would say it's informed by a view. And they actually want to believe that the progressive left is more dominant in the Democratic Party and Biden than is the case. I've talked to David French about this when he mm-hmm. and I have written essays on good news, for example, the ab- number of abortions uh, right. today at the, mm-hmm. and by the end of the, the Obama administration was lower than it was Roe v. Wade in 1973. Now, presumably that would be good news if you're pro-life because you've had this dramatic yeah. uh, drop in, in and, and also crime. Crime in the mm-hmm. early 90s was 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 at record levels and it's gone down a lot since then. But when you write about the good empirical news, that elicits not thankfulness or not mm redoubling the energy because we're making progress, it often elicits anger. Why Why would that be the case? The reason it is, <clears throat> is because that narrative of existential threat- You're challenging is, the narrative, yeah. Exactly. And of mm-hmm. course, for some of these organizations, you're challenging their funding because a lot of them raise money by constantly hitting the, the panic button. The, the hair doesn't tur- doesn't set itself on fire. It has to be constantly lit, right? Exactly. And, and, and if exactly. You, you point out the good news, then that, you know, that, you know, you have to re- reignite the fire, reignite the hair. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I think that that's, that's what's behind it. I, I think, you know, a fair amount of it is genuine, but again, it gets complicated because I think there's such a deep investment in creating these narratives. And then these narratives are part mm. of people's core identity. Right. So if you're having these discussions, I'm sure you've had these, these conversations yeah, yeah. where you've thought, you know, these, this is not just a policy disagreement. Th- this person is reacting as if it's an attack on who they are. Exactly. And it actually is because they, right. they have these views that it's are important. core to their identity. So if you yeah. were to criticize them on an issue, they interpret that as you're attacking my worldview. Yeah. So I think I have borrowed an idea from from you and Jonathan Rausch. Um, the because and, and I know you and I agree, and some of our listeners may not agree that that um, there is illiberalism on the left and there's illiberalism on the right. That the liberal values are facing a two front a, a, attack. And I think right. I think you know for people who said there's no illiberalism on on the left, I think what you're seeing with the Hamas uh, uh, support is is indication of that. But the analogy that I borrowed from you and Jonathan is the distinction between cancer and a heart attack, that the threat from MAGA liberalism is immediate. It is tangible. It must be dealt with now. It doesn't mean you ignore the liberalism on the left or pretend that it doesn't exist or do not challenge it. But the liberalism on the right, um, and you wrote a really great piece with, uh, with Jonathan Rausch about this, that, that the liberalism on the left does not justify what we are now seeing on on the right. So do you think that's a fair that that's a fair analogy heart attack versus cancer? Yeah, I, I do. I think John was the one who 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 first yeah. used it. <clears throat> um I mean at this point I I probably quite honestly would say that the that the threat to the uh to the republic from the right um is great significantly greater than the left. So maybe we're talking about broken bones versus cancer. Um <clears throat> I think that mm. Okay. For one thing, the attack on our electoral system um, is 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 more profound and more immediate um, on on the uh, on the right. I think, uh, uh, candidly, I think the derangement is just more wide widespread. Um, and I, I say that as somebody who still is considers myself conservative, and I do think that a mm-hmm. lot of what we see unfolding on the campuses is, is genuinely problematic. And, and Jonathan and I wrote about that mm-hmm. in in the New York Times piece. Right. Um, but there just doesn't seem to be a stopping. And I'll tell you the, <clears throat> excuse me, mm. I'll tell you that another thing, which is, I think, an important distinction right now between the Democratic and Republican parties, which is the leader of the Democratic Party, right. whatever your qualms with Joe Biden, yeah. is not uh, a person who is postmodern, nihilistic, and advocating the agenda of the progressive left. In fact, we're seeing right now in this moment criticisms within the Democratic Party of Biden because they feel like he's too pro-Israel. So the person who is the head of the party and really sets the tone of the party and the parameters of the party in many ways 
is a no normal, you know, Democrat within the sort of the traditional 40 yard lines, I would say, of American politics. That's not the case with the American right, the Republican Party. There, the, the front, overwhelming front runner, Donald Trump, is a sociopath. And he is getting more deranged and more dangerous, you know, with every passing week. His his statements, you know, make Mein Kampf seem like a subtle text. I mean, he is advertising what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. There is no uh, no veneer, no no, no, no subtlety, effort to distance, no secrecy, <clears throat> no subtlety. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, it's the opposite. The more outrageous he is, the more that gins up his his support. That, to me, is a significant uh, difference between the American right and the American left right now. Yeah. What did you think of, of his use of the word vermin? I'm, 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 I'm I guess I'm stuck on that because. Yeah, I, it, it it just seems so distinctive. It's got such historical resonance. I, yes. I know that he, that he's not a man of words. He's not a man of of of, of, of thinking in depth, but. That that word made it into a rather important statement. Um, yeah. What did you think of him referring to his opponents as vermin? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think it's typical of him. I think he was given the word. I think it was intentional because I don't think it's even Miller. He, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think it's a word. A he would know, or B he would know the historical context. I think probably when he was told what it means and the context of it. He said, that's is exactly the word that I want to use. Look, this is not, this is a, this is something we've seen, not just in, in Nazi Germany, but, but, but throughout, we saw it in Rwanda and, and, and really through many of the most gruesome uh, revolutions in, in, in history, which is the dehumanization, right? That's the thing that has to happen. That, right. that pre dates and, 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 uh, it's 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 the it's the groundwork that needs to be laid to try and use extraordinary means to defeat your enemy. You have to dehumanize them. And so if you go over Trump's rhetoric uh, going back to 2015 and really er earlier than that, it's a constant dehumanization and dehumanization, the amount of <clears throat> dehumanization. I mean, everything we've described, you know, children of light versus children of darkness, the forces yes. of Satan. You are, in fact, evil. You are, in fact, dangerous. And if we can also dehumanize you and make you into vermin, this is a toxic stew. <clears throat> Oh, it's, I think it's a really toxic stew. It, 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 it really worries me now. I mean, I will say that America, because of its, its traditions, its history, its institutions, it's a country that is as probably well prepared to deal with these kind of threats as, as any country. And it withstood it in 2020, but it barely withstood it. And a few key people in a few different positions, if they had acted differently, Things could have gone in a very different direction. And I'm not at all confident that if for Trump were to win in 2024, that our institutions could could uh, could survive like they did in 2020. And as, as you've talked about, there are now efforts by Stephen Miller and others to try and get into essentially a government in waiting, trying to learn from the lessons that that uh, from 2016. So Trump's imprint, uh, his most malevolent imprint his most uh, depraved imprint on the country will will be done in a way that it wasn't in 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 a first uh, in a first term and so you're seeing this rhetoric kind of ratcheting up and w one other thing i just want to say charlie about how how this happens which is you think about things that trump has said or done in the last month or or certainly you know 2020 mm -hmm. the coup attempt and and the effort to storm the capitol if you had talked to a trump supporter in uh October of 2016 or February of 2017, right. and we're able to fast forward and say, this is what he's going to do. They would have genuinely, many of them would have genuinely been shocked and they would yeah. have said in, in good conscience, I would not stand uh, no. with this right. person. I won't go with that. This would, no. I won't right. go with that. And now they do. And that is the lesson of how people accommodate themselves with with one moral norm and transgression after another. So th this is what has always struck me about Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He is who he is. There's there's no secret. There's no subtlety. There, there is no mystery. Right. What he has done 
to his supporters watch and turn the, the, the you know turn the camera away from him and look at the crowd yep. the way he has transformed american culture um you know one of the questions i, I we all wrestle with is you know if not for if not for donald yep. trump would this be happening would would these people be making these decisions would would we have had this transvaluation of values this collapse yep. of you know of of, of belief in, in 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 character and i mean a lot of it would have happened anyway but yeah. um, I have a hard time thinking, you know, if not for Donald Trump, that we would not be in a very different place. It wouldn't be, a, you know, paradise. But there's yeah. so much of this that traces back to looking at him and this moral rot that has taken place right. just the way you described in just the last few years. And it doesn't seem to be abating in any way. No, no. If anything, it's it's accelerating. And I agree. I agree with you and how you and how you describe it. it. It would have gone on. Uh, but but Trump accelerated. The one thing that's important to keep in mind, of course, is that um, in 2015, when Trump announced he was going to, you know, when he, mm -hmm. in June, he announced he was going to get in the race, mm -hmm. he got into the race. Um, almost nobody uh, was was willing to give him a chance. I, I wrote a piece in July of 2015, it's three weeks after he announced. And the title of the of the of it was. Uh, President Donald Trump question mark just say no, oh. and I uh, I was warning about his appeal, and an awful lot of people thought you know why is the New York Times giving real estate to this guy he's he's a passing phenomenon and he's he's, right. he's an epiphenomenon it's not gonna it's not gonna last, and uh, um, there there was a sense I had at that point that he was resonating with with the base. I actually wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, hmm. in 2011 on the GOP and the birther trap, where I warned about Trump yeah. and I said, "Don't play, don't play footsie with people with these conspiracy theories because you're going, you're going to regret it." Wow, this pressure. And my point in saying that was yeah. that um, it wasn't simply that Trump sort of came out out, out of next uh, ex nihilo, like he, did, you know, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. He tapped into something he didn't have that much money he didn't right. have the history in the republican party the the t the uh, group that he faced in 2016 were pretty accomplished republicans and there was pretty much any flavor of ice cream that you wanted whether you were right. a libertarian or a cultural conservative or a you know a marco rubio jeb bush conservative or chris kirsty or Mike Huckabee or Rick Santorum, you know, they were all representative one de degree or, an, or another. And the fact is that Trump, without a history in the Republican Party, in fact, having supported the Democratic Party, having said that he was fine with partial partial mm -hmm. abortion and so forth, won the, and, and was energizing the base, said that the base was there. He tapped into it. Now, when he tapped into it, he has this uh, kind of reptilian Mm -hmm. intelligence or the reptilian right. instinct of how to in energize and connect with 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 his base but that base was already there and that meant that something was happening pre-trump that, that was worrisome so that's why i agree with you that if trump had lost we would be in a very different place but i think that these issues would still you know they'd still they'd still be with them but once he won the nomination, and especially when he won the presidency, you know, that changed everything. And his capacity to imprint the Republican Party, I, I would argue that his imprint on the Republican Party, Trump's imprint on the Republican Party is greater than Reagan's was. And great, Reagan's was enormous. I, I, I can't argue with me with you about that. I mean, I think that people thought there was a pendulum, the pendulum would swing back. And in fact, uh, I think the analogy that works is a ratchet effect, and and and, yep. and it's it's going right. to be very hard to take it back. Peter Weiner is a contributing writer at the Atlantic and the New York Times. You really ought to read his piece on Mike Johnson, the polite zealotry of Mike Johnson. Peter, it is so good to have you back on the podcast. Thank you so much. Always great to be with you. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again.